been at the forefront of innovation and discovery. In 1946, Argonne was established to develop peaceful uses for a revolutionary new source of energy, nuclear power. The world has changed greatly since then, giving rise to complex new challenges. To stay at the forefront, Argonne has evolved from something singular and isolated into something collaborative and global. Today, Argonne is a multidisciplinary research powerhouse at the leading edge of discovery science, technology development, energy innovation, environmental sustainability, and national security. Together with the U.S. Department of Energy and the University of Chicago, we are partnering with industry, government agencies, and universities to pursue big, game-changing ideas that benefit the region, the nation, and beyond. We bring the best scientists and engineers together with the most advanced scientific tools and facilities to tackle the world's greatest challenges. Developing advanced battery technologies for transportation and the electric grid. Building and operating powerful research tools to advance the boundaries of science. Designing new materials for renewable energy sources. Understanding the microbial world to revolutionize medicine and the treatment of disease. Leading the way in designing more intelligent cities. As the world continues to evolve, so will the challenges we must address. For Argonne, this presents an opportunity to anticipate change and pursue scientific and technological breakthroughs that transform industries and make life better for everyone. Good evening, and welcome to Argonne National Laboratory's first virtual out loud lecture. I'm Leslie Crone, Argonne's Chief Communications Officer, and I'm pleased that so many of you have joined this forum. Argonne's out loud lecture series is one way we share some of our most interesting science stories and discoveries that impact our lives and our world. The lectures address a diverse range of topics, including medical discoveries, extreme weather events, and cybersecurity. This evening's focus is on Argonne's impact in the fight to end the COVID-19 pandemic. Before we start, please let me explain how we will manage this meeting. We're using the BlueJeans platform for this virtual event. It works best in the Chrome browser. So if you have connected using another browser, you may want to exit and reconnect with Chrome. Your video and audio were automatically turned off when you joined the meeting. If you're logged in via the web or the app, you should be able to see our presentation. Right now, you should be seeing a slide that says, out loud lecture series. To optimize the experience for everyone and keep bandwidth requirements to your homes low, we've eliminated video of our speakers. We will be sharing slides and you'll hear our speakers, but you won't see the speakers. If you have questions related to the technology of the meeting, if you can't hear what we're saying, for example, use the moderator, ugh, moderator chat feature and we will help you troubleshoot. There will be a Q&A session after this evening's main presentation. To ask questions, use the Q&A function. You can submit your questions at any time. If you want to ask a question, but someone has already submitted it, you can like the question so that we know it is important to more people. Look for the square Q&A at the right of your screen. It should be the fourth gray icon down from the top. And with that, it is my Pleasure to introduce Argonne National Laboratory's director, Paul Kearns. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, let me add my welcome, really, to you for our first virtual Argonne Out Loud lecture. Thank you for logging on to be to hear about Argonne's great contributions in the fight against COVID-19. I am Paul Kearns, the director of Argonne National Laboratory. I have the a tremendous honor and responsibility of leading Argonne during this unprecedented time. Since Argonne's beginning in 1946, we have unlocked new science frontiers and solved big, complex problems for our country. The lab is not new to leading research associated with fighting large-scale public health crises. Our scientists have worked on finding ways to prevent, diagnose, and fight threats such as the H1N1 virus 
this 2003 SARS virus and the past uh, E. coli outbreaks as well. Just last year, our research contributed to the development of a promising drug for Ebola with higher survival rates, rates than other treatments. Before the current coronavirus hit, we were focused on accelerating science and technology for U.S. prosperity and security. That is exactly what we are doing during the pandemic. And while tonight you will hear about our COVID-19 work, we continue to work hard on research for innovative battery technologies, manufacturing for the circular economy, uh, the electric security grid, artificial intelligence, quantum networks and communication, and many other scientific mysteries. This virus is one of the greatest challenges that our society currently faces. It is affecting all of us, both here at home and across the world. Over the past couple of months, Argonne has brought scientific leadership and unique facilities together to contribute toward the global battle against COVID-19. We're collaborating with local, national, and international partners. Our COVID-19 research is comprehensive and at a scale that cannot be matched by any single company or organization on their own. Tonight, you'll hear from three of our scientists leading this groundbreaking work. First, Dr. Steven Streifer, the Interim Director of Science and the Associate uh, Laboratory Director for Photon Sciences, We'll discuss how our X-ray beam lines are shining new light on the protein composition of a novel, novel uh, coronavirus. Understanding the virus's uh, configuration will help uh, develop a vaccine and other effective antiviral medications to slow its transmission. Then Rick Stevens, the Associate Laboratory Director for Computing, Environment, and Life Sciences and a professor at the University of Chicago, We'll talk about how our supercomputers are modeling and simulating the potential potential drugs and to treat COVID-19. Research that used to take years with test trials now takes a fraction of the time with artificial intelligence. Lastly, Dr. Chick Makel, an Argonne Distinguished a Scientist and Group Leader of Social, Behavioral, and Decision Science at the laboratory, will address how we are advising state and national governments. He and his team are modeling the virus's progression and providing the needed information for policymakers to determine the most effective interventions to help the public keep safe. Thank you for being here virtually. Uh, while I wish we could meet in person like we usually do at the laboratory for the Outlaw Lecture Series, I'm pleased that so many of you have, have joined us online. Joining us are current uh, lab colleagues, uh, retired workers, so welcome back family, friends, neighbors, stakeholders, and of course, um, perhaps most importantly, the general public to learn about the laboratory and its research. Obviously, we have a large extended RDOT community, and you are all part of it. It is reassuring that we have so many that are interested in innovative science that we do all, every day. We appreciate you being here and invite you to become a regular at the Argon Out Loud Lecture Series. Stephen, uh, please start tonight's program. Well, thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here and welcome everybody to tonight's uh, discussion about the uh, virus that causes COVID-19. Uh, the name of the virus is the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which you may have seen it referred to. So what I'm gonna do with this talk is I'm gonna give you an introduction to what the virus is and what it's made of, the proteins that make up the virus and how we use the structure of those proteins, knowledge about the structure of those proteins to understand how we can design drugs, and other compounds that will allow us to create antivirals and vaccines to be able to treat and ultimately, we hope, to prevent the, uh, the disease. So next slide, please. So here's the uh, virus itself. This just gives you an uh, artist rendition of what the virus looks like. And just to put scale on this, the virus, the virus itself is about 100 nanometers large. Now, if you compare that to a human hair, which is about 100 microns, what that means is about 1,000 viruses stacked end to end will cross a human hair just to set the scale. And what you see drawn here in the different colors are the different proteins that make up the virus. And perhaps uh, just reading in the newspaper, you've heard about a number of these, including the spike protein and other proteins that make up the virus. And what these proteins do is they help the virus either uh, maintain its structure, make up its structure, 
or they're involved in the replication or infection process as the virus is entering into human cells. There are approximately 28 proteins. Uh, it's a little bit of an uh, argument in the scientific community over exactly how many, but about 28 proteins that make up the virus. About 16 of these are proteins, so-called non-structural proteins, which um, the virus produces in a human cell, and then those are involved in the replication of the virus. And then a number of the proteins, again, with the example of the spike glycoprotein, these are the proteins that you see that latch onto a human cell and ultimately help the protein enter into that human cell and then proceed on the uh, process of, uh, of uh, replicating itself, which is, of course, what ultimately the infection uh, uh, entails. So why is all this important? Next slide, please. So it turns out, if we think about the way that proteins and uh, uh, biological processes work, uh, it works very much like a lock and key mechanism. If you think about the proteins that make up the virus, or if you think about the proteins that are present in a human cell, the way that they interact with each other is through what looks like a lock and key. Now, that then brings up a number of interesting questions. The first thing is, what we would like to do is understand the structure of that interaction, i.e. what makes up the lock. And then, for instance, if we're trying to design a drug that will either uh, cause a protein to do something or, in the alternative case, block up a protein from doing something, we can think of that as effectively the key or, in the case of preventing a protein from doing something, something that gums up the lock, effectively putting superglue into the lock so that the key can't fit. So all of the functions that are involved in the virus infecting cells in our body are involved with these proteins I just mentioned, and these interact with the proteins in the body through a lock and key mechanism. And we can think of the drugs that interact with those proteins that may be able to interfere with those uh, functions and prevent the infection from uh, progressing or from worsening, or in the case of a vaccine, prevent the infection from happening at, happening at all by having the body's antibodies attack the protein. Uh, on the, the virus. These are the lock and key. The drug uh, represents the key. The protein represents the lock. So what we need to do to start this off is to understand the structures of those keys and locks. So the way that we do that, next slide, please. As Paul was mentioning, we do this by shining extremely bright x-rays onto the proteins that uh, make up the, the virus. And we do this at a facility at Argonne called the Advanced Photon Source. Uh, you see a picture of it here. It's about a kilometer in circumference, about two-thirds of a mile in circumference. Uh, just to give you a sense of a scale, uh, if you dropped Wrigley Field in the middle of the ring here, it would fit very nicely. So it's a very large facility. And the way that we produce x-rays with this is actually a quantum mechanical and relativistic effect where we circulate electrons in a storage ring. As those electrons are circulating in the storage ring at almost the speed of light, we pass those through magnetic arrays, which wiggle the beam and cause X-rays to be given off by some quantum mechanical effect. And then we send these ultra intense X-rays about a billion times brighter than you can uh, get out of a doctor's office down what we refer to beam lines, and then eventually put those X-rays onto a protein sample that's been expressed out of bacteria uh, using exactly the same tricks we use, for instance, to manufacture insulin. Um, we, we take those proteins, we crystallize them, and then focus those X-rays onto those proteins to be able to get their structure. Next slide, please. So this shows you what the inside of one of the stations where we actually do these x-ray experiments looks like. So if you can see here, what we have is an individual who's standing next to the uh, apparatus where we actually mount the protein crystals. Um, and uh, in front of them are two doers, which are typically filled with liquid nitrogen. The protein crystals are actually stored in those doers, filled with liquid nitrogen so that they don't degrade. A robot will typically pick one of these out of uh, the a protein crystal on a on a uh, what we refer to as a loop out of the door and mount it onto the goniometer, which I'll show you on the next slide. And then we focus X-rays onto that, and then from the X-rays scattered from that protein crystal onto a very large detector, we can use computers to deduce where the atoms are in the protein structure. So next slide, please. This zooms in on the area of the uh, apparatus where we actually meant, uh, where we actually mount the protein crystals. So on the uh, left-hand side, you see a zoom in of the area in which we actually mount the uh, the, the the loop. Uh, this is the little copper-colored uh, uh, pen which would actually hold that. And then on the right side, you see a microscope image of protein crystals that have been trapped onto one of these loops. Now, to give you a sense of scale here. Each of these protein crystals is about a fifth of the size of a human hair. Uh, 
There are a few tens of microns on each side, again, about a fifth of the size of a human hair. And inside each of those crystals are tens or hundreds of millions of copies of the protein of interest to structure we're trying to measure. And again, by shining x-rays on this and then collecting those x-rays onto a detector after they've interacted with the sample, we can determine the atomic positions uh, of the atoms that make up the protein or drugs that are interacting with that protein. Next slide, please. So what I'm gonna show you here is actually the picture of a protein from the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the so-called main protease. You may hear a little bit more about this from Rick when he talks later on. And what you saw zoom in there was a particular drug molecule. It turns out to be an FDA approved hepatitis C drug as it mates into the protein crystal. So what you saw in the first um, instance before the animation was the lock made up of all these little circles which are indicating the atoms that make up the protein. So this gives you an idea of how incredibly complex these entities are. Uh, the different circles represent, uh, the different colors represent uh, different atoms. Uh, the white little dots, those are hydrogen atoms in the structure. The gray dots are the carbons in the structure. The blue circles are the nitrogens in the structure. The red are the oxygens. And occasionally you can see sort of buried in the middle of this thing, uh, yellow spheres, which represent uh, sulfurs that are part of the protein structure of this particular piece of the virus. And what you saw coming in was a molecule again that docks to a particular location on that protein structure, which is called the active site, where the, the magic happens, where things are mating together to either uh, allow that protein to produce some function in the replication or infection cycle, or in this case, by putting a, a drug there, that would allow us to block that interaction at that active site and therefore prevent something from happening. Now, the way that biologists understand these very complicated structures is, of course, not to look at the atoms themselves, but next slide, please. We do this by essentially understanding the building blocks that make up these types of proteins and relating them from one to another. So this is exactly the same structure that I just showed you, but it's a cartoon that represents the functional elements of the protein uh, in a way that biologists can build these up and relate them to other proteins, look for similarities, uh, look for structures that might have occurred before to give them clues about things that might uh, be able to mate to those proteins. And shown as a stick figure in this case is a different model of the drug mated to that same active site. So this gives you a sense of the way that biologists understand these proteins. And again, by understanding these different components and how they're assembled together, we can start to get insights into the function of the protein, the things that might mate uh, to them, and the way in which we can develop drugs that would interfere with those processes. It turns out there's a much uh, more elegant way to approach that same problem rather than first measuring the structure and then trying to come up with drugs, as Rick will talk about. Once we know the structure, we can also start to do computational studies of the structure and drugs as a way to start to uh, get a, a head start on the sorts of things that might actually have activity against the proteins and the virus itself. So going to the next slide, please. So finally, just to talk a little bit about how this work actually occurs at the advanced photon source. Uh, the way that this works is argon is responsible for producing the x-rays and operating some of the x-ray end stations. The research is actually done by research groups that come to us throughout the United States, and typically if we're in a normal uh, situation as opposed to the travel restrictions that we're all under, uh, research groups that literally come from around the world, to use the x-rays we produce at the APS to look at any uh, one of a number of problems, in this case the biological structures that we're talking about today. And to give you a sense of the amount of activity that's going on on the protein structures involved in the COVID-19 epidemic, more than 40 research groups are actively working at the APS from a number of different uh, US universities and pharmaceutical companies to try to understand structures, corresponding to literally hundreds of researchers who are coming to us uh, over the course of the last several weeks to do these types of experiments to gain insights into how we can fight the virus. At the APS, we've uh, developed uh, or been able to determine, these researchers have been able to determine more than 30 structures related to either the proteins themselves or protein complexes that are bound to either a potential drug or some other antibody that we use in understanding how we might fight the disease. So with that introduction to the virus, the proteins that make it up, and what we're trying to understand about those proteins, I'll turn it over to Rick Stevens to talk about the way that his team is using Argon's high-performance computers to design drugs to attack the virus. Rick, please. Okay, I think I'm on. Um, thanks, Stephen, for that uh, introduction. So uh, uh, let's go to my first slide, please. 
So Stephen had talked about uh, the virus, and uh, I, I thought it, I'd talk a little bit about uh, more about the virus before we start talking about computation. So first of all, as Stephen said, the virus is very small, about one thousandth the diameter of a human hair. Uh, the virus is a single-stranded RNA virus. Um, so coronaviruses are very common. Uh, they occur in, in pretty much all species of mammals, and they're they're very common. Um, and we'll talk more about uh, some of the related viruses to the uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, so the virus has a capsule on the outside that contains a uh, structural, uh, kind of think of it as a capsule, like a pill, essentially. And the outside is made up of uh, these proteins uh, with the spike as the mechanism for getting into the human cell. And inside uh, this capsule is a bunch of RNA uh, that's rolled up uh, uh, and, and packed up inside this sphere, this tiny sphere. Um, viruses, unlike bacteria, are not alive. Uh, viruses don't have any metabolism. There's no, they don't grow, they don't breathe. They, they're basically just little machines. Um, and uh, uh, they need a host. In, our ca in the case of, of the uh, SARS-CoV-2, they need a human host uh, to replicate. Okay? And so our job in terms of finding uh, drugs uh, that would um, treat this virus or vaccines is either to stop the virus from getting into the human cells or to prevent it from replicating in the human cells. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, <clears throat> uh, Stephen said there's about uh, 28 uh, proteins, 27 proteins. There's some debate. Uh, it's actually how it encodes the proteins is somewhat complicated, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that um, is causing uh, COVID-19 um, originated, uh, we think the natural host for this virus is in bats. Um, that was the case also in SARS-1 and in MERS. Um, in those two cases, uh, the, the virus transferred from a bat uh, to an intermediate host and then to humans. So in the case of SARS-1, it went from a bat to a, a civet, which is a type of wild, a small wild cat-like animal. Um, and then into the host. In the case of MERS, it started out in bats, and then the intermediate host was a camel, and then like, it was infected uh, into people from camels. In the case of SARS-CoV-2, we actually don't know what the intermediate host is. Um, there, there's still the expectation that there was an intermediate host. Um, the chart here shows uh, some of the uh, viruses that we can compare uh, the, the genome sequence to. Uh, so it's about 96% identical to uh, the natural strain of coronavirus that lives in the bat species uh, in, in China, where uh, we think the virus originated. Um, there are, are coronaviruses in, a, in a, an animal called a pagolin, uh, which is not quite as, as closely related to this virus as the bat. Um, this virus is about 80% similar to the SARS-1, and I'll come back to that in a second because that's hugely important, and about 50% similar to MERS, and about 50% similar to a common cold uh, virus. Um, so if you go um, to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so the, the virus uh, has a very compact genome. It's about uh, 29,000 uh, 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 base pairs long. As I said, it's single-stranded RNA. There's no DNA in the virus. Um, and it essentially has um, three, uh, pat, uh, three segments of RNA that get uh, translated into proteins. Um, and uh, the gray part here is what Stephen referred to as the non-structural proteins. So this codes for proteins that carry out work of replicating the virus in conjunction with the human cell apparatus. Um, the proteins that are encoded on the right that are in blue, these are the proteins that essentially um, either uh, uh, form the capsule around the virus, or in one case, the N protein there actually uh, is a protein that helps the, the single-stranded RNA fold up inside the virus. Um, so we think of this largely as two collections of targets for therapy. The targets that are on the outside of the virus, these are things that are pretty good vaccine targets because your body uh, can produce antibodies that would recognize those proteins outside the, uh, the human cell, say it's circulating in blood or on the surface of the cell. And so antibody design efforts are focused on that part of the virus uh, proteome. Uh, the proteins that are encoded here in the gray are things that take, make up the internal machinery that help the virus replicate. And these would be 
ideal targets for small molecules, typical drug molecules, that would somehow disrupt the virus replication in the cell. Next slide, please. So uh, fortunately, or unfortunately, um, SARS-CoV-1 uh, um, happened about uh, not quite 10 years, or uh, well, mid-2000s, and um, as a result, the scientific community has been studying these types of viruses for quite a long time. And we, uh, from previous work, um, using things like the advanced photon source, there were structures determined for many of the key proteins from that original SARS-1 virus. What we're seeing here on, on this slide here are uh, uh, images of the protein structures, just like what Stephen was talking about. But here what we've highlighted in purple are the places where <clears throat> the SARS-2 protein is different from the SARS-1 protein. Um, so mutations are colored in purple or maybe pinkish, depending on your screen. Um, and uh, novel uh, new sequences are colored in yellow. So what this means is though, while we could be uh, trying to develop drugs for SARS-1, the proteins aren't exactly the same, and therefore dr drugs that work with SARS-1 may not work uh, with SARS-2 and would require additional work, And is, which is why it's also important to produce new protein structures that are actually from the SARS-2 virus. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, there's a couple different strategies for treatment uh, or for therapy, essentially. Um, one strategy is to block the virus from gaining entry to the cell. Um, so if you had an antibody, like in the case of a vaccine, it would uh, latch onto the virus that would direct the immune system to go to where that virus uh, is present and essentially destroy the virus before it infect the cell. Um, but if you don't have a, a vaccine or antibodies or before the body can actually develop antibodies, um, you'd want to try to block the virus's ability to get into the cell. It has two different ways to get into the cell. Um, one way it recognizes um, a, a protein on the cell surface of the human cell called an ACE2 receptor that fits like a lock and key onto the spike protein, and that causes the cell to pull the virus into it because that's just uh, how the biology works. There's a couple other ways in which it can get into the cell, but um, so in the top box here, these would be drug targets where we try to block that entry into the cell. Um, the second layer of defense that we try to do is block the virus replication inside the cell. So we're basically throwing monkey, monkey wrenches into the gears of producing copies of the virus. So the way, the way a virus works is it gets into the cell, it takes over the machinery inside the cell, the normal replication machinery that, that all human cells have, uh, for producing copies of RNA uh, into proteins, and it takes over that machinery and makes copies of itself. It takes about 10 hours um, from when a virus infects the cell to when uh, the cell is uh, ready to release more viruses, and in that process, about 1,300 copies of the virus are made in that 10 hours. So the second uh, layer of defense would be to try to gum up the works um, in, in that making that copy, and the third layer of defense is that Many of the complications of being infected with COVID-2 are actually not because the virus is somehow um, damaging the cells directly, it's because the body uh, overreacts, the immune system overreacts. So a third class of drug targets are actually trying to modulate how the body responds to the virus. Um, and each one of these has a different set of proteins. Next slide, please. So um, a normal drug development, um, if you think about new cancer drugs or new drugs for heart disease or something like that would, might take 10 to 15 years and would cost on the order of six to $10 billion. Um, and uh, the reason for that is that most, uh, uh, most initial candidate drugs actually fail either in clinical trials or because they're not effective enough to be licensed or they're too toxic or they have bad side effects. Um, and so uh, one of the biggest challenges is to quickly identify uh, a handful of, of drugs that are both effective and non-toxic and can be tolerated uh, by, uh, by the body in a large population without side effects. It turns out that um, there's more than 10 to the 60th possible small molecule drugs. That is 10 to the 60th power. That's more than the number of uh, stars you know, in the universe. And there's no possible way we could search through that entire space. The number of drugs or small molecules that are drug-like that have been actually 
um, created either on a computer or in physical labs uh, is, a, is less than 10 billion of them. And, and the number that you can actually order if you're a scientist is about 6 million of them. And the number that's actually on the market right now is about 9,000. So our first job is to figure out, are any of the current drugs on the market actually able to perform the functions of blocking the virus replication? We've been using computers to search through all of the existing drugs, their structures, and docking them uh, to all of the protein structures that Stephen talked about. Um, that, that's a work that takes, uh, I mean, it's, it's doable. Um, but further than that, we've been using AI methods to actually search um, over 4 billion molecules per target. So go to the next slide, please. So we've been using uh, artificial intelligence to actually learn uh, the properties of binding, of, of small molecules binding to the proteins. We train it on a data set of about a million calculations and then run it to search through this very large 4 billion uh, molecule collection of known molecules and then take the highest scoring hits from those uh, machine learning sweeps and then redock those using uh, mathematical methods onto the proteins and the best scoring molecules then get uh, transferred to our experimental colleagues for uh, measuring their uh, properties to inhibit virus function and ultimately passed on to uh, secure uh, biocontainment laboratories uh, to do full cell uh, assays on live virus and on animal assays eventually after that. So that's a, a high level view of, of how we're using uh, supercomputers. Uh, this would not be possible without the massive computing power that we have at Argonne and our sister laboratories and universities around the country. Uh, the Department of Energy has worked uh, with uh, all the major supercomputing providers uh, in the US to create a high performance computing consortium that's available to researchers around the country working on uh, SARS-2 and COVID-19 related research. So with that summary, I'm going to pass the uh, virtual baton here to uh, Chick Makel, who's going to talk to us about modeling the virus spread and affecting policy decisions by using supercomputers. Take it away, Chick. Uh, thank you, Rick. Uh, it's great to be here tonight uh, talking to you about some of the great science we are doing here at Argonne, focusing on COVID-19. I hope everyone is doing well, staying safe in these difficult times. Next slide, please. Decision makers at all levels of government, whether it be federal, state, local, have many questions related to COVID-19 and the pandemic such as how many people will become infected by COVID-19? When will the peak happen? How many people will require hospitalization? How can we flatten the curve? Will the stay at home order reduce the spread? By how much? Do protective behaviors such as wearing masks and social distancing help reduce the transmission of the virus? If so, by how much? How can we best ease the restrictions and open the economy? How will contact tracing help reduce the spread? And many other questions, including, of course, when will this all be over? Decision makers want to know, what does the science say? At Argonne, we are bringing science to decision making by modeling the COVID-19 spread, focusing specifically on the city of Chicago. In particular, we are bringing system science to answer these questions by modeling the entire city of Chicago and everybody in it. I mentioned decision makers. We are connected with the mayor's office in Chicago as well as the governor's office to understand what the current critical questions are that government officials are asking. And we are applying our computer models to run what if scenarios and test interventions as well as easing strategies that decision makers could implement. Although we are applying the model initially to Chicago, we are actively researching how to expand our model to other areas, including the entire Chicago metropolitan area. Next slide, please. 
We have a unique kind of model that I'm talking about here at Argon, which we have affectionately named City COVID. City COVID is what is called an agent-based model. An agent-based model basically represents everyone in an entire population at the individual level. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between individual people in the population and the software agents that are in the model. We don't actually have data on everyone in Chicago specific to them. And we statistically kind of represent the population using census and other publicly available data. But when you add it all up for the whole population, the results of the modeling, as well as the data upon which it's based, all reflect uh, the actual statistics of the population. As you can imagine, modeling an entire city uh, produces a challenge. The scale of modeling a city is enormous. Uh, we have 2.7 million individual agents represented in the model, and they move to and from the 1.2 million locations uh, in the city on an hourly basis. So we simulate hour by hour from day to day, week to week, month to month, over the course of an entire year by hour increments, people's activities and what that means for uh, basically people who are infected with COVID-19, possibly passing on the infection to other individuals. We also model the behaviors of the agents as well as their characteristics. And by behaviors, I mean how they make decisions to go to places, uh, mobility type decisions in the course of their daily life. Of course, with the stay at home order, those decisions uh, for the most part are fairly simple to, to model. Most people are staying at home. So we have our agents staying at home, at least up to the levels that we have observed people staying at home inside uh, our working model. Next slide, please. The, the, just kind of very briefly how the model works. The model works with what, as I uh, referred to earlier, a synthetic population. That's our, our name for uh, basically three parts of the model, the data that goes into the model. And these consist of people, uh, places, as I mentioned, as well as the activities that people engage in and the schedules they keep to participate in those activities. So we basically have each person in the model uh, assigned a daily schedule, which as I said, operates by hour. And that schedule then allows us to simulate people going from place to place by hour and uh, going to the various places to engage in activities. At that point, uh, people and agents in the model could be co-located at the same place. So they might be in the same school, the same workplace, the same office uh, building. And that co-location that we model then gives the possibility of any infected individuals passing on that infection to susceptible people at that same location. And we model that with a particular probability of that occurring within an hour time span. And uh, yes, one way to think of the city COVID model is that it's like SimCity, but there's a difference. Uh, city COVID is calibrated to real world data uh, on a real time basis. And it's designed to reflect the realities of uh, people's behaviors and people's movements. Uh, as best as possible. The more data that we get, the better we are able to calibrate the model, so to speak, uh, to the reality. Next slide, please. Um, basically, 
what the model's outcomes are, uh, are forecasts. And I use the term forecast uh, to be similar to the term that's used in weather forecasting. We are not predicting the future, but we are forecasting the probabilities or most likely outcomes that all the data and the science behind it implies uh, for what the future looks like. And in particular, we're forecasting uh, in city COVID the number of cases or infections uh, uh, of people with uh, COVID-19, as well as death counts and hospitalization uh, uh, required and other key factors that go into answering the, the key questions decision makers have. Um, the, the chart on the right uh, basically shows uh, the black dots, if, you, if you're able to see those, the black circles, show actual data over time uh, on basically the, uh, the deaths, COVID-19 uh, related deaths in Chicago. And the red bands, the region, are model forecasts that come out of, of the model. Uh, the reason there's a band is because of the uncertainties that are involved in uh, making these forecasts. But uh, as you can see, the, the model is forecasting quite closely to what the actual data shows. And so this, is, this gives us a great deal of confidence in the model. Uh, and, uh, of course, is really the first question that decision makers ask us is, why should we believe you, you know, in terms of what you're saying? And part of this uh, calibration, model calibration exercise, as well as validation, as we call it, uh, is really an essential step in the whole process. And I, I, I also will say that the, the, the reason we're able to do this kind of real-time calibration is because of uh, basic, basically the powerful computers that we have at Argonne that Rick mentioned, as well as the use of machine learning and AI algorithms that are, are being applied to this uh, problem that, that really I think we're at the forefront in the, in the entire field of uh, what we call epidemiological modeling and the ability to do this kind of forecasting. Our model is, as I said, is very unique at its great level of detail and granularity. And I'll show you some of the things that allows us to do uh, coming up. Uh, next slide, please. As I mentioned, oh yes, thank you. The animation is, is, is going. So what, what the animation is showing on the right is basically the city of Chicago divided into uh, uh, zip code areas, and uh, we are looking at different levels of basically, uh, you know, compliance over time uh, that we are assuming that people engage in or adhere to with respect to the stay-at-home order, as well as uh, 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 prescriptive uh, protective behaviors that they could engage in. But the degree of granularity that I mentioned, you know, being able to model at the individual level and uh, at the spatial level uh, is really unmatched in being, uh, allowing us to model the disease spreading patterns as well as who in Chicago might be particularly prone to, to you know, where the hotspots could be for infections and, and, and this kind of, uh, uh, ability to do forecasting uh, can be very helpful to decision makers to understand where they might, for example, deploy contact tracing people. You know, they might be needed in, in one part of the city versus another. Uh, the forecast that we make uh, reflect varying assumptions about individual behavior as well as uh, the government guidance uh, on reopening. and. Lately, the past week or so, we've been heavily engaged in looking at reopening uh, questions uh, that uh, the decision makers are, are asking and trying to understand how 
and reopening could be done in phases and the timing and what the effects are. Next slide, please. Um, this, this slide is, is really one of the, our key findings that uh, we came out with last week. Uh, I hope it's not too hard to read, but, but basically we looked at, um, well, what the, what the slide is plotting is on the, on the bottom axis across the bottom are the dates uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the, first, the first black line on the left side of each graph there is basically when the stay-at-home order went into effect uh, that the governor uh, instituted. It was about, I think, March 21st, if I'm not mistaken. And the next line, which is the red line, is uh, June 1st. And that's been, uh, so we ran the simulation to consider what the impact would be for reopening on June 1st. Um, what the effects would be, and this shows the total number of people infected in the city of Chicago. We ran it for two scenarios. On the left side graph, in the center of the slide, uh, we assumed people would continue to engage in these protective behaviors at the same level that we were able to measure from the data that we were getting from the city of Chicago and what our model results are showing us. Basically, we showed that the stay-at-home order, on top of reducing activities of people, also effectively reduced uh, transmission of the virus between people for those contexts that were still going on by 95%. So whether it's people wearing masks or, or keeping six feet apart from each other, uh, washing their hands, uh, washing down surfaces, et cetera, all of those things that people were doing had a, an enormous effect. And the, the, the result shows if people continue to do that, even after we start to open on June 1st, that in, the number of infections will continue to go down. As to whether people will, you know, uh, continue that good behavior, so to speak, uh, you know, it, it remains to be seen. Uh, and so we said, well, what if people are, you know, there's a little bit of a, a lax in, 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 in adherence to those, uh, you know, protective behaviors after we open. So on the right side, the graph shows after that red, red line that goes up and down that the number of infections immediately begins to increase if people become very uh, lax with respect to you know, these protective behaviors. So, uh, you know, all the data, uh, well, a lot of the data is showing us that people, you know, won't uh, become lax. And there's certainly a lot of uh, plans for reopening in place that uh, are including protective behaviors, people wearing masks to go to the store and things that are, are uh, get, you know, give, give us optimism that the infection, even after opening, could, will continue to go down and avoid what we're showing here is a second peak uh, that is possible, which is as, as large as the first peak, which occurs during the course of the summer. So uh, yeah, as I mentioned, we're running many scenarios uh, using our supercomputer at Argonne, running thousands and thousands of different uh, scenarios with respect to different assumptions different values for the, uh, uh, the parameters of infection rates and how long it takes for people to clear the infection. All the parameters are, are uh, being uh, considered in the distribution, probabilistic distributions they were actually able to run, you know, on the supercomputer to come up with these results. So uh, Thank you very much for listening, and uh, I'm now going to turn things back to Leslie. Thank you very much, Chick, and thanks to Rick and Stephen as well for sharing your important research with us. Now it's time for us to hear from you, everyone in our virtual audience. Again, to ask a question, please use the Q&A function that is on the right side of your screen. Look for the square Q&A on the right, 
It should be the fourth gray icon down from the top. There's a lot of you on the line. We will do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Uh, if you use the like button, it will help us know which topics are of most interest to the group. So with that, I'm going to start with a question that has most likes so far, 20 of them. And Rick, I think that I'm going to direct this one to you. Question is, how many strains of the virus have been identified? And have any of the variants seen been different enough to cause unique infections? So that's a great question. We, um, the international community has been sequencing uh, many, many samples of the virus. The current database has over 20,000 samples in it. Not everyone who gets infected is, uh, has, their, has the genome of the virus sequenced, but we have over 20,000 sequences from all over the world. And um, so far, there's only been uh, two hints at, at, at strains. Um, and uh, the two strains are uh, almost identical with a, with a handful of mutations that distinguish them. Um, and um, it's a little bit too early to understand whether they have really different uh, dynamics. Uh, one of them seems to be uh, able to be transmitted slightly easier and is perhaps less uh, virulent. Um, and the other strain is uh, a little bit more difficult to transmit and is more virulent. And that's kind of consistent with how viruses normally evolve. Um, viruses are uh, ideally, I mean, from their perspective, not that they have brains or anything, but, but from the evolutionary perspective of the virus, it's not very useful for it to kill the host or to be extremely virulent because that uh, stops the transmission. So, um, but so far there's no uh, really big difference in the strains. Great, thanks. Uh, Chick, I'm gonna send this next question to you. It says, how does the US modeling behavior and actual data compare with other countries who display varying rates of incidence and death? For instance, are these models being used in other countries or cities? Uh, yes, modeling is, is kind of being uh, used all over now. Uh, people familiar with, uh, you know, the following the modeling uh, uh, kind of um, as it's been unfolding, kind of started with, uh, you know, the Imperial College model, uh, predicting po up to a million U.S. deaths as well as uh, a million or so in the U.K., and these were those projections were done very early uh, in uh, January. Uh, basically, it's referred to the, as the Ferguson model. And um, since then, you know, we've had the IHME model out of the University of Washington and Chris Murray's group. Um, and <clears throat> what I, I see two things: there's a proliferation of models. You know, everybody's got a model now. <laughs> if you're a modeler, why not? You know, make a model. That's probably good. Uh, in the sense of, you know, some models are better than others and, you know, the best models can, you know, really help us uh, provide some insights. The second thing I've noticed is <clears throat> everybody has a modeling group, whether you're the mayor, whether you're the governor, whether you're, well, the White House, basically. You, you, you know, you, you at least, for the first time ever, people are asking, decision makers are asking, what do the modelers have to say? Not that the modelers are making recommendations or certainly not making decisions, but at least the decision makers are asking the question. And it's really the same question as, what does the science say? And I think the modeling can contribute to those answers. All right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna direct this next question to Rick. It's a little bit of a two-parter. Um, one uh, is, why is it significant that the virus is all RNA and no DNA? And then the second question is, has the computer found any good molecules to fight COVID-19? What are the prospects looking like? Okay, so for the first question, why is the, the, the fact that the virus's genome is made up of RNA, and not only that, single-stranded RNA? So uh, the main effect of that uh, is that uh, the virus is not very accurate in copying itself. So uh, double-stranded DNA, which we have uh, in our human uh, genome, uh, is made of that. And um, most organisms, their underlying genome is almost everybody, every, every organism has got double-stranded DNA. And it copies very reliably. Uh, Single-stranded RNA uh, 
doesn't copy, it's about a thousand times less reliable than double-stranded RNA, or sorry, double-stranded uh, DNA. As a, the, what that means is that the virus can mutate relatively quickly. Um, this is one of the reasons why the common cold virus is, uh, why we don't get immunity to it, because every season it's a different, uh, it's a different organism, essentially. Um, so that's the main reason. Um, there's some other detailed evolutionary reasons for it, but those are not uh, the primary interest. Viruses can occur with double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA, double-stranded RNA, single-stranded RNA, and, and some uh, other variants. Um, and um, the other main thing is that uh, RNA viruses tend to be uh, much smaller genomes. They're much more efficiently encoded. So that's question number one. Question number two, uh, we have uh, searched, uh, you know, large numbers of uh, molecules. We have found molecules that are predicted to bind quite effectively to uh, various proteins in the virus, and those have been uh, forwarded to our experimental lab colleagues where they have been uh, doing experimental functional assays, and the ones that uh, pass through those assays are going to places where we have to do uh, screens with, with whole uh, whole cells that have uh, 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 amplification of the virus, or what you might think of as virus uh, life cycle. Um, so we have identified uh, many molecules. Um, there's a handful of molecules that are in the current uh, set of drugs that look potentially interesting, but there's there's nothing that looks uh, uh, in the current set of molecules, uh, in the current set of existing drugs, that looks like an ideal drug for this uh, virus. Um, but I would stay tuned. Uh, I think that there will be some additional drug uh, uh, opportunities and probably cocktails will be the way that uh, this will be treated. And I don't mean the kind that you get at a bar, but I mean uh, a treatment that has multiple drugs in it. Thanks, Rick. All right, Stephen, I'm going to send this one to you because I know that we've done some research on this topic at our Center for uh, Nanoscale Materials. Um, since the virus is so small, how can wearing a mask be effective? Uh, that's a really great question. And the answer to that is we're actually not trying to stop the virus. So what we're trying to stop is the liquid that comes out of your body that contains the virus. So uh, if you uh, go onto the uh, internet, there's some great animations on National Geographic, for instance, that show what happens when you sneeze. And it's all the stuff that comes out of your mouth when you sneeze, uh, all the moisture that comes out of the mouth that might contain virus particles that if you inhaled it, would give you the disease. So what we're trying to do with things like masks is not filter out the virus, but actually filter out those droplets that carry the virus. Turns out the virus itself isn't very robust. It doesn't actually live outside of that moist, wet environment very long. And that's one of the reasons that we believe that the main route of transmission is actually person to person. Uh, if somebody sneezes on you or coughs, or uh, uh, as recent studies have shown, even singing or loud speaking can help spread the virus. It's not through transmission so much by touching surfaces and other things like that. So some things are actually breaking our way. This could be much worse than it is. The means of transmission of the virus is mostly person to person. It's mostly these so-called aerosols and droplets, and that's what the mask is filtering out. In a lot of cases, remember as well, that people can be asymptomatic and still have the virus. So one of the other reasons you want people to wear masks is that droplets from their mouth don't get out of the mask and spread the virus. So it's not only keeping you from getting sick, it's keeping people who might be sick but don't know it from spreading the virus by trapping on the inside of their mask. That's another reason that you also have to be very careful when you take your mask off to make sure that you handle it in a way that you don't get your fingers all over the outside or the inside as the case may be, and make sure you wash your hands after you handle your mask. All right, great advice. Uh, Chick, I'm gonna send a couple of questions your way. They all have to do with the model and how it accounts for travelers. Travelers coming in from airports, uh, visitors coming in, residents going away on vacation and coming back in, and talking about that whole connected ecosystem, Wisconsin, Indiana, Illinois. Can you speak to how the model accounts for the movement of people in and out of the Chicago area? Uh, yes. Uh, well, the model accounts for the people in and out of the Chicago area to, to the extent that we're uh, able to access data on, you know, those movements of people in and out. Uh, particularly important 
uh, you know, uh, thing to, to model ins and outflow for, of course, are the airports and, you know, the uh, basically the international travel uh, that is, uh, you know, going to eventually come back someday, I guess. But um, so, yes, it's it's uh, simply a matter of uh, modeling, you know, the place to place movements uh, according to what the uh, the data sets are. And I will say this, though, the reason I'm kind of waffling a little bit is because the data sets are fairly poor on, uh, you know, international travel, uh, how many people come in and out of the airports. It's an area that we just have to uh, improve on, and I have a suspicion that we'll probably able to get more data on those kind of inflows and outflows uh, in the future. Okay, thank you. So, Rick, I'm going to send this one to you. Uh, it's about uh, you mentioned that the virus is a machine, right? It's a biological machine. So, any commentary on why viruses are important in the uh, greater web of biological life and death? Sure. So viruses have been around ever since life has been around on Earth. Um, early uh, bacterial cells uh, and now bacteria in the oceans uh, are outnumbered 10 to 1 by viruses. So, um, and bacteria outnumbers uh, everything else on the planet by orders and orders of magnitude. So um, viruses exist. Um, you can say that why do they exist in some philosophical sense? Because they um, are exploiting the fact that organisms have this machinery that allows them to reproduce. And um, in some sense, they're like cheating, right? They're a way to hijack that, to reproduce their own uh, self without actually carrying all the machinery needed to actually be fully alive. Um, in the ecosystem, particularly in the, say, bacterial ecosystems, where, where by the way, viruses are called phage, um, they actually play an important role in um, uh, in some sense, uh, steering up the mixture of species and environments. So um, if you were to take a, a kind of an ecological microscope, say, to an ocean, you would see that the species composition in the ocean of bacteria is not constant. It's constantly changing. It's changing because as a, a bacteria becomes resistant uh, or attempts to become resistant to a virus, it will uh, bloom and have many copies of itself, and then a virus will evolve that attacks that bacteria and kill most of it, and other bacteria will 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 replace it in in the web of life. So viruses have been around for a long time, essentially you know billions of years. Um, why they exist um, in uh, the case of say the human you know system or the animal system? If if you forget humans for a second, you would have viruses the same way that you have bacterial pathogens, um, because there's a niche that they can uh, exist in and they can replicate, they'll, they'll be there. And there's no way for us to eradicate viruses. I think it's really important right now that we understand why we're, we, we seem to be having uh, over the last 20, 30 years with uh, the SARS-1, with MERS, with Ebola, with Zika, like every few years, it's like we're having another uh, viral outbreak. And most of these viruses are coming from the natural environment um, and, and somehow becoming uh, uh, present in people. And that's happening in part because humans have pressed into many parts of the global ecosystems that we haven't historically had enormous contact with, whether it's in the rainforest or whether it's in uh, uh, places in Africa where uh, people are eating bush meat, or places in uh, Southeast Asia where uh, humans are just in much larger numbers living much closer to the natural environment. So we think that this kind of uh, transmission, what's called zoonotic transmission, that is from animals to people, is likely to actually continue uh, for a long time. And so uh, one lesson learned from the SARS-2 and, and COVID-19 situation is that we need to be much uh, readier to deal with this on not like a continuous pandemic basis, but on something that could occur every five to 10 years uh, for a long time. Great. Thanks, Rick. All right, I'm going to send this next question to Stephen. Um, you, you described the advanced photon source. So the question here is, can dynamic interactions of SARS-CoV-2 and antivirals be studied with the APS, or do you have to trap a static interaction in a crystal? 
Uh, it's an excellent question. So uh, one of the things I oversimplified when I talked about the lock and key model is the locks and the keys that we use in everyday life are actually static. You know, the, lo the lock doesn't change, the key doesn't change, and you made them up. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting about biology is as proteins are mating together, one of the things that they do as that happens is they actually change their structure in many cases to fit better together. They're actually reactive to each other. So one of the things that we can do is not only look at the static configurations that we've talked about tonight, which is uh, the main uh, technique that I showed you, uh, but also look at dynamic configurations where uh, through uh, techniques that are somewhat different than I talked about tonight, you can actually watch the time evolution of the way in which a drug molecule might uh, engage with a uh, protein that's of interest and give you insight into how the dynamics of that uh, happen. And in particular, one of the things that we're doing at Argon right now is we're upgrading the advanced photon source to be even brighter than it is today. We're gonna go from uh, where we are today to a factor of about a thousand brighter. And once we do that, we'll be able to look at these dynamic interactions uh, much more easily than we can today uh, by essentially taking a, a, a protein, mixing it with a drug compound, and then watching the structural involve in time exactly as this question is indicating. So great question. Most of what I talked about is actually the static structure, but the dynamics are also important, and we do have ways of looking like at those, and even more so we'll have ways of, uh, to look at those once we upgrade the APS. Thanks, Stephen. So um, I'm looking at the question that is uh, the number one liked one at this stage in our, our conversation. Um, and I, I think I'd probably uh, like to ask Dr. Kearns his view and, and the rest of our panelists if they'd like to chime in. It's a simple question. Is, is herd immunity feasible for COVID-19? Oh, this is Paul. Let me, let me jump in and uh, say, boy, I don't know. Uh, good question. I don't think we know the answer. The question at this point in time, uh, there's still a great deal to learn, and really what all the studies about, I think, uh, across the globe, additional insights needed. So I defer to, to others and to answer the question as well, please. Well, this is Rick. I can chime in a little bit. So herd immunity happens when uh, two things are in place. One is that um, uh, uh, people acquire immunity through a previous infection. So that, for that to be true, it means that uh, COVID would have to result in humans having acquired immunity after they've uh, had the disease that protects them for some period of time. I mean, it's quite common. I mean, I hear herd immunity, or not herd immunity, but immunity is quite common, uh, right? Uh, the second thing is that you have to have a large number of people to have that acquired immunity. And that uh, magical number is somewhere around 70%. Um, we, you know, we don't know exactly what the number is, but it's, 70% or maybe 80%. And when that happens, that means that on average, um, the people that are interacting with each other, um, you know, 80%, 70 or 80% of them will have already had the disease and therefore they can't be uh, uh, able to transmit it uh, to others. And it's, it's kind of like uh, the same number that Chick was talking about in the simulation. If, if you have these uh, uh, behaviors that slow down transmission, and if 80% or 90% of the population is basically not able to transmit the uh, virus, then you virus uh, doesn't uh, catch on across the population. So that's the concept of herd immunity. Um, but what it would mean practically is that a very large fraction of the population will have had to somehow acquire this immunity. Um, if we didn't have a vaccine, the only way to acquire it would have actually would actually be by having the disease. If we have a vaccine, then the idea is to vaccinate enough people um, that the vaccinated part of the population would act as that uh, that blocker for the rest of the population. Uh, uh, hi, hi, this is Chick. I um, I guess uh, my view is that uh, I really hope we have herd immunity. Um, because the alternative, and maybe, you know, the numbers people throw around are 70, 80 percent of the population, uh, you know, having been infected uh, and not being able to pass it along then. But, uh, you know, the alternative to, to let's, if we don't have herd immunity, what will happen most likely is that every single person will become infected uh, with uh, COVID-19 eventually to the extent that their immune system, you know, can't, you know, fight it off before it begins. So uh, 
Uh, I think that, it, you know, a, a lot of uh, research on uh, or plans for the contact tracing that are that are going on now are really designed to uh, identify people who are infected, as well as the antibody testing. The combination of those two things could really offer the possibility, at, uh, at least, of putting a stop you know, to the spread before everyone gets infected. This is, uh, Stephen, just to add to that very quickly, I think one thing to keep in mind is uh, the concept of herd immunity is uh, is very powerful. And, uh, you know, as Rick has said, certainly it's a last resort. It is that, it's a last resort. But this is a deadly virus, much, much worse than a bad flu. And we got to be really careful around it. Um, what Chick uh, was talking about earlier, the need to maintain good hygiene and social distancing, it's really important that we prevent the spread of this virus and prevent it from uh, overwhelming our healthcare systems and killing our friends and neighbors. And I think that's why what we're doing as uh, Argonne National Laboratory, and in fact, really the greater scientific community, trying to develop effective antivirals that can actually treat infections and ultimately come up with a vaccine, which is a substitute for herd immunity, uh, through uh, natural infection, that's really where we need to go. Um, if you look, for instance, at Sweden versus Norway, where Sweden has really tried to uh, foster that concept of uh, herd immunity, it's not going so well. The death rate there is much higher than the countries around it. And I think we would prefer not to pay that price. That's a huge human cost. We need to develop drugs. That's the intelligent way to go about it. All right, we've got time for one or two more. Um, Paul, I'm gonna ask you to address this and Stephen, you may wanna chime in as well. The question is really around how is all of this information um, being shared with the federal government and our fellow national laboratories across the country? Well, thank you, Leslie. Uh, really much of the, the research we do is sponsored by the federal government. And so uh, we engage with them as we define the research to be done. Uh, and then uh, provide them the information uh, just as soon as it's available and we have confidence in it. So it's really a quite dynamic process in that way. It's uh, an exchange that occurs through uh, sharing data, sharing reports, uh, presentations such as these, and, and really uh, done in, a, in this kind of a scenario, really in a very timely way so that uh, the information is put in the hands of uh, decision makers rather quickly. Uh, Stephen's been leading uh, what we call the uh, National Virtual Biotechnology Laboratory, which uh, I'll ask him to speak on uh, basically as one of the vehicles that the Department of Energy is using to gather uh, information and, and capabilities and information regarding how best to fight COVID-19. So Stephen, please. Yeah, it's actually a good point, Paul. So when people talk about the Department of Energy, uh, this is not the research that you usually think about. Um, but hopefully tonight what we've shown you is we have these great capabilities at places like Argonne National Laboratory that really can uh, help us understand uh, things like viruses and the supercomputers that are based here at Argonne and other national laboratories that allow us to do the uh, the computer science and the computations uh, to do the sorts of things that Rick and Chick talk about, talked about today. So uh, very early on as COVID-19 was starting to spread in the U.S., and just to remind people, COVID-19 is the disease it's caused by the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. The virus is the thing that causes the disease. Um, as it started to spread in the United States, the Department of Energy National Laboratories, there's seven to, 17 of us spread across the country, uh, came together uh, as a way to uh, basically link up our capabilities and start to identify the most important problems that we can help the nation with in trying to, uh, to address the uh, pandemic that's in front of us right now. So some of the things we've been working on include the work that you've heard today, the computational models, trying to understand how the infection spreads, applying computational techniques to understand how to develop drugs and vaccines uh, to be able to address uh, the threat in humans. Uh, we're doing a lot of work on materials as well, trying to develop uh, alternative ways to manufacture things like face masks and the uh, components that go into diagnostic testing kits. 
looking at ways in which we can develop uh, new materials that uh, would make surfaces uh, resistant to the virus staying alive on the on that surface once the virus left the human body. So by coming together like this, we really are bringing uh, the power of the uh, the Department of Energy Research Complex to bear on this problem that we hope is going to accelerate our ability to address the problems it causes, uh, either, uh, again, by accelerating uh, cures and treatments or simply by making uh, testing much more available than it is now. Uh, and this has really been an amazing thing to be involved with, and uh, I think uh, the country should be very proud of the way in which your tax dollars are being used through the National Laboratory Complex to be able to attack this threat to our nation. All right. Well, with that, we've come to the end of our forum. Uh, but before we close, I'd like to thank Dr. Kearns, Stephen Streifer, Rick Stevens, and Chick Makel for their remarks and their presentations. And I'd also like to thank everyone who has joined us, uh, the members of our virtual audience, for attending, for your thoughtful questions, for your interest and passion for science. Uh, several people had asked questions about how they could stay up to date on all of the research that we are doing, and the best place to look for that is our website, which is www.anl.gov, and we update that frequently with uh, new science, uh, especially around uh, COVID-19. This event has been recorded, and you'll get an email tomorrow. Uh, you can listen to it again and share it with your colleagues, your friends, your family. We are planning future Out Loud lectures, uh, typically do them through the summer season, so please look for email invitations for future events. We hope you enjoyed your virtual visit with Argonne this evening. Hope you stay healthy and have a good night. Thank you. <laughs>